Good morning, everybody. Um, the title is um, From Cyber War to Corporate Threats. Now, we live in a world really where we are dependent on computers and we're dependent on the internet. And the internet has gradually over the years seeped into more and more areas of our daily existence and continues to do so to the point really at which we're beginning to see everyday objects that are connected in one way or another. Um, so this had a, a major impact really in terms of malware development anyway. Um, so we, we've gone really in the space of 10 or 12 years from malware written really as vandalism, cyber vandalism, causing disruption, causing problems, causing nothing at all, just done for the heck of it to prove how clever people are, through to malware for profit. Um, and the opening up of the internet to our daily lives really has meant more points of contact that we can be probed and pushed and, and prodded by the cyber criminals. And I really want to talk about um, the sort of far end of that really, which is the use of technology as a weapon, but also, most importantly, the impact that has on any, any business. Because there's a danger, when you read the headlines and, and you, you hear about Stuxnet or Dooku or some of these other cyber weapons, which we believe have got nation state involvement behind them, you think, well, I'm not a nation state, I'm not a big corporation, I'm not in the defense industry, what on earth would attacker want with me or my company? But actually there is a, a, a knock-on impact and there are reasons why targeted attackers would be interested in us and why the code they use or certain groups use to go after um, government installations, if you will, or critical infrastructure installations, that does have a knock-on effect on individual businesses um, and other organizations. So we talked, uh, or I talked a little bit there about the, the origins from cyber vandalism to making money. Cyber criminals clearly are motivated by finance. They want to make money and there's a business underpinning malware development of which malware creation is just a part. And you've got uh, people, small businesses, big businesses, uh, you've got value-add resellers and, and so on. But, but one way or another, that criminal business is, is motivated by money, just as in the final analysis, legitimate business is, is driven by, by money. Nation states, of course, are motivated by other things. They're not really looking to steal money from other governments. They're, they're looking to defend the realm. Uh, they're looking to, to protect critical infrastructure in a particular country. They're looking to find out information from other nations, find out what they're doing and so on. So all of the things that they've been doing for generations, but today they're using computers to do it. What they're doing um, on the back of that motivation is they're trying to find out secrets. They're trying to disrupt the activities of, if you like, competing nations or um, in, in some way trying to damage some process that is going on in an installation in another country. Now if we look back at the beginnings of targeted attacks, um, one of the first was, was known as Aurora um, and Google was just one company that went public about uh, this attack which they believed certainly was uh, driven by the Chinese. Uh, other, other companies were impacted by this and this was around about January 2010 although the attacks themselves had gone on throughout 2009. So this was sort of the opening uh, of the curtain if you like on, on this particular type of attack. Uh, a shift away from random speculative attacks on you and me or, or this or that business for money more to uh, other types of, of purpose. Um, and then we got to sort of the middle of 2010 um, and we had Stuxnet and this really is considered to be the first cyber weapon. Um, so why do we think there was nation state involvement in this? There's nothing in the code, we can't prove it, uh, you know there's no comments in there and if there were comments in the code they could easily be just there as a red herring. So we're basing it on the fact that this highly modular code was clearly developed by different teams cooperating. This thing was designed to 
target specifically Simatic WinCC um, installations on SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. More than that, this thing was specifically designed, it's generally believed anyway, to undermine Iran's nuclear program. And if you're going to get involved in something as specific as that, you're going to need to test it. And if you're going to test it on particular hardware and particular software which is controlling that hardware, that's going to take an awful lot of investment. So for all of those reasons, we believe this really required brains, know-how, money, beyond the level of regular cyber criminal groups. This thing used five vulnerabilities, which was unheard of really. Four of them were zero-day vulnerabilities, ones which were unknown to the people whose software they targeted. Um, it also made use of stolen digital certificates in order to give credibility to the code. So that, that, that's really why we, we believe it had nation-state involvement. Um, we can't actually you know, prove that. As I say, there's nothing documentary within the code which would indicate that. Uh, the media certainly believed that. The, uh, the New York Times ran a piece where they identified, they believe, the, the perpetrators, the US, with Israeli help. There's nothing in the code to back that up or substantiate it. Okay, so that, that really was a wake-up call. Um, Aurora was going after commercial organizations. Uh, Stuxnet was clearly not. It was government to government. Um, and that was followed on in, in 2011 by Dooku. And um, what was interesting when we looked at Stuxnet was, although we kind of saw it in 2010, the development behind it went back to 2005. So the more we found out about Stuxnet, the further back the date was going. Not just us at Kaspersky Lab, but Symantec and others as well. Um, and the same was true for Dooku. Um, it went back to at least 2007. And it turned out, in fact, that there was commonality between Dooku and Stuxnet. There was a common platform, which we called the Tilded platform. Um, and so it seemed there had been cooperation, even though the modules were different. This, again, was highly modular and there were different pieces of code or different modules for different targets. And again, it was a, a cyber espionage thing rather than a sabotage thing. So Stuxnet, sabotage, this one was finding out secrets. Uh, and then in 2012 we saw Flame, and again we saw commonality in terms of the code. Um, some of the modules anyway, there, there was commonality there. Um, Flame again was highly modular, um, and was again focused on data gathering, uh, gathering information on the systems, and specifically in this case, gathering information by USB. Um, so it, it basically put code on, on the USB and used it as a repository for the information, such that if there wasn't a connection to send data back directly over the wire from a victim, it would actually sort of lie dormant, if you like, in the hope that somebody would take the USB key to another machine which did have a connection, at which point then it would upload the information. So, detection middle of, uh, middle of 2012, and I, I guess um, one of the, the striking things about Flame was that it sort of took zero day to, to a new level. This thing masqueraded as, as a Windows update. Um, it was able to basically spoof, um, spoof itself, set itself up as the, the, the Windows server and effectively had free reign over what were supposedly patched computers but of course the patches hadn't been applied. Um, and um, th there was also, you know, there are elements in, in, in this particular threat, Flame, but also in others that we come across which, you know, we can't necessarily pin down and know what they are. Um, so you see the code and you, you don't necessarily know. One of these was the installation of a font, uh, Pallid and Narrow, and, and it's still not really known what that font was installed for. And it may well have been that they hadn't got as far as making use of it and it was for some designed purpose which, which hadn't, hadn't evolved at the point at which this was all discovered. 
Now the three guys on the screen there have one thing in common and that is that they're all mathematicians, well-known mathematicians. Um, and uh, Gauss is, is actually the name which was given to a data stealing module within the, the malware of that name. Um, and there are other modules as well with, uh, with the names of other mathematicians in it, but that's the main module in this one. Um, so Gauss uh, again was an espionage program from July 2012, um, but it also had elements of a banking trojan about it. So it was sort of state to state, but there was also this banking trojan aspect where it was specifically focused on victims in the Middle East. Now as we'll see as we go through, not all targeted attacks, even of this kind, are focused on mi Middle East. Certainly some of the early ones were, but it, 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 it's a worldwide phenomenon really. Uh, in 2012 we also um, saw, saw another threat um, and, and Elvis was the name of one of the modules, hence the, the link and the name we gave to this. Um, but it was actually um, also known as Mini Flame. Um, and it, it, it was actually usable either as a standalone module or as a module within either Gauss or Flame. So it was something spun off basically. So if we look at, at, up to that sort of point of, of, of mini flame and, and I guess by the end of 2012, these were the cyber weapons that we'd identified. Now if we look, if we represent malware as a whole as a pyramid, the base of that pyramid, probably 90% of it, is random speculative attacks. 10% would be targeted attacks, 0.1% would be these particular type of, of attacks. So numerically, not very big, and probably not, never going to be numerically big uh, as a, a percentage of malware overall. But obviously the impact of something like that is huge. Um, certainly Iran had to replace wholesale centrifuges in one of its, at least one of its plants. So that's a big impact. But y your imagination can kind of take you further and we'll come back to this several times on what impact that could have on critical infrastructure systems. So the impact this can have on society goes way beyond the numeric value as a percentage of the overall malware pie, if you like. The two shades of green there indicate what we know for sure and what we, we believe is the scale of these attacks. So why? Why is there a difference? Why don't we know everything? Well, typically we will get a feel for what a particular piece of malware is doing by sinkholing the, the botnet which is, is controlling it. So we're able to effectively eavesdrop on part of the network, either of cyber criminals or, or governments if it's government involvement. But we can't wrap our arms around the whole thing typically, so we have to kind of guess at what the overall scale is. But what's interesting here is if you compare it to say attacks from 10 years before, so MyDoom, Bugbear, um, NetSky, Bagel, and, and these types of mass mailing attacks, which were literally going after millions of people, or even more recently, Conficker, which you know, we believe that there could have been 8 million uh, victims of, of that particular threat and the aim was to spread as far as possible as fast as possible. The aim of a targeted attack, especially one of this nature, very selective. Now in fact, you know, you look in and you think, well okay, if, if, if it was designed, Stuxnet, to disrupt Iran's nuclear program, how come there are over 3, 300,000 victims? That's because it was a worm and although it may have had one target, there was lots of other collateral damage. That may have been because the people behind it didn't want everyone to know who the target was, or it could just have been that they reached for the worm as a successful attack vector and weren't able to control the, the additional collateral damage. But I mean, you get down to something like mini flame and you have tens of victims. Now, sometimes it is specific victims with a targeted attack, like some of these. Sometimes it's a particular vertical within the market, so going after research institutions, going after the energy sector, going after the diplomatic um, community. So it varies. Um, taking it sort of further on in, in 2012, um, the, the name of a group, the Cutting Sword of Justice, 
um, w was behind Shamoon. And Shamoon most famously, or no notoriously I should say, um, impacted Saudi Aramco and basically wiped information from about 30,000 computers. You can imagine if you're somebody like Saudi Aramco, the impact that is going to have on your business. They weren't the only victim. Razgas was another one. Um, and we believe there were others as well. So this idea of, of wiping data, it, it sort of borrowed from the 90s, actually. Uh, you know, the cyber vandalism days. But clearly here, there is a motive beyond just showing how clever they are or disruption for the hell of it. There's, there's a purpose behind it. Um, what was interesting, I, I suppose, about Wiper as well was it, it spawned, or, or it was one of a number of copycat ideas that had come from um, a suspected threat. Um, Kaspersky Lab got called in by the International Telecommunications Union to look at uh, a particular organization where there seemed to be evidence of malware which was, was whole, doing wholesale wiping of, of data. Um, actually Wiper itself as a threat has never been detected. Uh, we did find evidence of flame, we did find evidence of gauss and that was the beginnings of how we got to know about those. We never found Wiper although we found significant evidence that it had been there so we found the the after effects of it rather than the threat itself. But it did spawn others including Shamoon, um, including something called Dark Soul um, and um, a, a bunch of other threats along the same lines. So we've got this cyber espionage, sabotage, data wiping, various different impact. Um, and then widening it out really, and these are attacks which don't specifically go after government installations or critical infrastructure necessarily but nevertheless have a big impact on those organizations that are on the receiving end of them. Um, so this was the scale of, of Red October. I mean don't take the gray areas as immune. It could well be that I mean once this thing was detected these guys pretty much stopped their operation as happens a lot with malware operations. So it may have been that other areas were intended to be targets later on in the campaign. Bear in mind also that the information we have on this is what we're able to sinkhole. So we don't again have our arms around the whole activity. But you can see that there are victims worldwide and down the left there on the blue panel if you can read it are, are the types of victim. And it includes um, aerospace and military, it includes research organizations, academic institutions, uh, government and, and diplomatic missions, a whole range of different targets. Um, into 2013 we got another example of it. This one more specific than Red October. WinNTI was going after games uh, developers and specifically online games developers and um, it never really trickled down to the people playing the games, although clearly that could potentially have been one of the, uh, the, the impacts of this later down the line. Uh, but again, these guys stopped their operation. Um, but it was looking to specifically steal intellectual property from the servers of games developers. Um, and um, again, that can have a major impact because this is a huge sector within the economy. Lots of people play online games. Um, that chart was sort of published part way through our, our discussion or discovery of this campaign. It actually went further than that. Uh, there was a victim in the UK as well, but very select. It, w it wasn't really after other types of uh, organizations or businesses within the overall marketplace. It was focused very much on game developers. Um, Net Traveler, more like Red October, closer to that sort of model, again going after particular verticals and some of the same. So activists is one addition to the list that wasn't with Red October. And you know we've seen, uh, if, you, if you take one group of activists, Tibetan activists, They've been targeted on and off for the last two years at different times, along with other sort of human rights groups as well, on and off. But again, some of the same victims, government, military, and so on. Um, and then, to 
towards the uh, the sort of end of, of, of 2013 we, we came to ice fog now ice fog ties in with something I said earlier at the beginning of the presentation that if you see some of these headline attacks and you think well we're a business of 50 people 100 people 200 people why would somebody go after us uh, and this sort of answers the question because this was very much focused on supply chain organizations initially ice fog was focused on Japan and South Korea and Taiwan later it widened its uh, field of view to take in North America as well um, and maybe others that, that we're not aware of but they were going after supply chain and if you think about it the connectedness of the economy means that a big organization is going to have um, connections to smaller organizations uh, an example and, and this isn't from a targeted attack but imagine that as an attacker I want to go after somebody in the automotive industry well probably those big car manufacturers are going to have in-house IT experts and many of them maybe they've got a lot of expertise in dealing with cyber attacks a, a lot of expertise in protecting the organization so a full-on assault may well be difficult but they've got connections to other organizations that produce small components for cars who probably have some degree of network access who may actually have access to plans for the next car and are a lot easier to attack because they maybe will only have tens of employees or hundreds of employees so actually a supply chain organization could be the weakest link and could be used as a stepping stone to go from one organization to another now sometimes that can be deliberate um, if you think back to um, about three years ago when RSA was attacked and RSA went public with this and, and wrote, wrote a great write-up on, on the attack on their organization um, they, they stole the algorithm behind the, the one-time passcodes the RSA keys some months later uh, it turned out Lockheed Martin had suffered an attempted breach anyway Lockheed Martin is a customer of RSA they use those, those uh, tokens um, now as far as I know nothing was stolen but, but was that fortuitous or was it deliberate were they used as a stepping stone to get to that organization one that certainly was fortuitous I, I, I would say would be um, an attack on Dropbox uh, people who are customers of Dropbox started getting lots of spam and it looked like there had been a sort of traditional hack of Dropbox but turned out no that's not what had happened what happened and it was blogged by Dropbox was another website totally unconnected with Dropbox and its business got hacked they stole details on people who were customers of that website including names and, and email addresses and passwords one of them was a Dropbox employee who was using the same password on this website and they speculatively tried it on, on the Dropbox site and it worked um, and I mean let's face it there are many many people use the same password for multiple sites so that's a cautionary tale for all of us as individuals let alone businesses um, one of the most recent uh, of these targeted attacks and it, it needs to go on that chart with those, those five others like Flame and Dooku and so on is Kareto and um, we saw I think about 300 victims individual victims from about a thousand IP addresses and it's, it's worldwide so you know we've got the US, Switzerland, Brazil um, parts of the Middle East as well, Iran and Libya there uh, and so on it goes so again another worldwide cyber espionage campaign and again another one we believe um, probably has nation state involvement this one th there's indications of uh, Spanish speakers developing the code for this but we can't really draw conclusions from that because it would be easy for you know a nation to get Spanish speakers to develop the code to make it look like it was written or launched by a Spanish speaking country so you know we've kind of got an increasing number really of, of black swans and we're no longer at a point where we have individual um, events that are out of sync with what else is going on there's a head of steam if you like building up this is becoming um, a bigger problem and that 10 percent of targeted attacks certainly is one we believe will expand and grow 
I, I don't myself believe it will ever become you know the 90 percent which is now the, the, the speculative attacks but it's going to grow because it's lucrative yes you can launch a phishing attack and you can make tiny amounts of money from lots and lots of victims but with something like this you know you can either make money from one big attack or you know let's face it you can get information that can be useful to governments and useful to competitors so what we're seeing really is a widening of the motivation behind attacks beyond just making money so what are the dangers then really of targeted attacks for ordinary businesses maybe small and medium sized businesses as well well one is you can be collateral damage so there were people impacted by uh, Stuxnet in Russia and other parts of the world who we don't believe were intended to be on the receiving end of it but this was a worm and worms spread so that's one aspect of it you become collateral damage the other is that the ideas developed in one of these sophisticated targeted attacks then gets reused by cyber criminals because if there are modules within Stuxnet or Flame which nobody really had thought of before they broke new ground once they're out there and people can maybe see the source code if it's published or reverse engineer it um, or they read media reports or reports from people in the industry like us they get ideas of what they can do um, so once you've kind of invented some new concept you can't de-invent it it's out there and other people can reuse it I guess lower down the stack in terms of uh, cyber criminal activity and there is also cases of downright commercialization of exploits so if you take um, hold that thought for a moment but the, the collateral damage you think about some of the people that could be impacted by that um, I, I said that uh, Stuxnet had impacted businesses elsewhere including Russia in the case of Russia it was um, a, an oil manufacturer so you know it could be telecommunications um, it could be um, financial organizations um, it could be people who are doing cloud hosting it, it could be any number of different types of organization it could be some of the critical infrastructure like water purification like power plants there's a, a vast number of organizations who if they're caught up in one of these attacks it will have quite a severe impact on society as a whole so Chevron was, was um, a, a, again a, a a company that was uh, impacted. I can't remember whether that was Stuxnet or an, another uh, sophisticated attack who went public with, with the fact that they'd been hit. Um, so the borrowed ideas and techniques, yes, can have an impact. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that all organizations pretty much have a customer face. All organizations are to one degree or another dependent on the internet and one of the dangers, I mean even if you're running a closed system there's a danger that something can get in so you take something like Stuxnet, I mean let's face it, nuclear uh, plants of one kind or another around the world are not going to be hooked up to the internet in the way let's say that Kaspersky lab or Plymouth University are going to be hooked up to the internet they're going to be effectively closed systems so whoever wants to attack them has to find a way in is the bar high? Sure it is. It's a harder job to do than it is to attack a commercial organization that is willing people to come and approach it. But the problem is once you get in, then you can probably run riot because closed systems will typically be not patched as well because you don't want to interfere with a mission critical process and if you apply a patch that disrupts that system that's really really bad news they may be running on old systems because you don't want to interrupt a particular process and therefore if it's working carry on using it so the wall might be high but if the wolf is able to scale the wall it can run amok inside that wall garden if you will now example I said hold that thought about commercialization of exploits um, this particular um, thing I mean, if you look back here this is December not the last one, the one before, so December 2012 
uh, and you look at the average users per day impacted by this particular exploit and it's 4,000 um, and then you get to December the 14th and it's gone up to 5,000 and it grows and grows and grows and grows that particular exploit what is it it's the exploit that was used in Dooku so a nation-state attack but the actual exploit that was created for it goes public and is very valuable to cyber criminal groups who aren't looking to go after governments or looking to go after critical infrastructure they're looking to go after businesses and of course small and medium sized businesses in particular who don't necessarily have in-house expertise who don't necessarily understand the importance of patching systems or using firewalls and so on could well be on the receiving end of this kind of thing and, and become, if you like, indirectly collateral damage. So you look at these Java, Office, Adobe Reader, Internet Explorer, they've all got something in common and that is that malware writers will target them. They will write exploit code designed to take advantage of vulnerabilities. If we look back at 2013, 90 something percent of the vulnerabilities that were targeted by virus writers, by Trojan and worm writers, were, were Java. And that's not because Java is buggy code uh, any more than Office or Adobe Reader are. It's the fact that that's what's targeted most because it's widespread and people don't necessarily patch it uh, as often as they should. They're not as vigilant. So Java, four updates a year, one extra one last year which they did out of band but that's it. Compare that to Microsoft where there's a patch every every month and occasionally out of band patches as well. So over the years the, 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 the targeting of Microsoft components has gone down and down. So too with Adobe. Initially you were in a situation where you had to download and apply a patch and at that point Adobe got targeted a lot. It was about 25 percent targeted in 2012 it was about two and a half percent targeted in 2013 because they're automated now so these guys will go after what what is easy to do so the naked truth is that threats are everywhere and it's not just government to government um, it, it's not just stealing commercial information what before computers were used used to be called industrial espionage it's really old the use of computers to do it is not old but the idea is it's also, you know, guys like Anonymous um, may be involved in protesting about something, um, may be involved, as they have been, in taking down child abuse rings. It, it could vary. I mean, there were targeted attacks on, the, or a targeted attack on the French Euromillion site about two and a half years ago because people didn't like gambling. So if you have an axe to grind, whether that's commercial, whether that's government, um, whether that's just mischief makers, uh, whether that's social and political protest, you can do it now. As protesters, you don't need to camp outside St. Paul's Cathedral. I mean, that will still work, but if you take down a website, if you launch a denial of service attack, if you deface a website, you can have an impact too. So this I've already talked about. This is kind of where we are right now in terms of the scale, but this probably numerically won't get any bigger, but this, this bit of it, this 10% will grow. And there are threats from all angles. I mean, there are, are um, unpatched applications. Um, there are, is financial and intellectual property which people are storing. There's the danger uh, because of the use of mobile devices within business, including with a lot of companies, people's own personal mobiles you are used throughout an organization. And that really means that there's no wall that an IT department can build around the workplace like it could in the past. It actually means they have to put a wrap around me because wherever I go, that's the reach of the corporate network. So for all these reasons, really, we are, are potentially vulnerable to attack and it's becoming increasingly difficult to defend. So in terms of defense, well, you know, you may have read like I did uh, a few months ago about a piece about uh, AV is dead. Um, and, and this was sort of well publicized, well covered in the media. Uh, AV is no good and, it, and it's dead. If by AV you mean signature scanning, which is we detect a threat, we analyze it, we find 
a sequence of bytes which can be used to identify that threat in the same way that a trailer for a movie identifies a movie then that really it's not dead but it's been diminishing over the years more and more and more and the reason is because we see more than 300,000 unique samples every day more than 300,000 per day so we couldn't possibly cope with 300,000 new samples by just detecting them creating a signature every time because it would be too late to protect people so the center of gravity has shifted much more towards the proactive hence you know things like um, default deny the use of whitelisting systems to say if it's not on the VIP list don't let it into the club um, or access control or um, you know cloud-based systems in order to get a, a fast delivery to, to new threats um, heuristic sandboxing zero day protection all of these really mean that if we take AV as a summary for endpoint protection, then no, it's not dead. If we take AV as traditional signature protection, then certainly it is of diminishing value. So I, I would contend really given the spread of threats, given the motivations that we're seeing now, and given the impact that some of these sophisticated ha threats have when they trickle down and get used by cyber criminals, then defending the enterprise is a much more complicated issue now and really has to include a range of technologies beyond traditional antivirus. So with that I'm going to uh, draw to a close. Okay. Thank you.